Uh, and you can find those on the end of each pew. Uh, just add your name and then pass it on to the next person. Now, if you see someone sitting in your row, this is a good opportunity to learn their name. Make sure that you welcome them warmly in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, a few announcements that I'd like to call to your attention. Uh, first, something that didn't make it into the bulletin, but it is very important. We are going to be gathering here on Saturday morning for a church work day. We do this usually uh, a good enough time to prepare for our homecoming and make the, the grounds pretty for, for folks coming out for that. We're going to be uh, putting out some, some pine straw and just cleaning up the area. So if you'd like to join us uh, on Saturday for that, we'd love to have you out at 8 in the morning. We'll, we'll gather to do that. Um, we also have later on uh, next Saturday, Trunk or Treat. That's going to be Saturday. We're really excited about that. We had a really good turnout last year and are hoping for a very good turn, turnout this year. It's a good safe alternative. Uh, to folks going around neighborhoods. This, this provides uh, a safe place for kids to gather and uh, just do some trick-or-treating. So if you'd like to decorate a trunk, we would love to have you come and join us for that. That starts at 6 o'clock next Saturday. Um, we also have uh, this morning Stephen Prince, our chair of deacons, who is coming to, uh, to bring an announcement to us this morning. Stephen? Nominating committee report for 2017 2018. I'd like for all of y'all to be there. Thank you. Uh, also, one uh, final announcement from the drama committee. They are asking that if you have any interest uh, in signing up to help us with the, uh, uh, with the live nativity, we need to hear from you pretty much yesterday. So if you could call the office uh, tomorrow morning, pretty much we will know if we're going to be able to do the live nativity or not. I think uh, it's been a very vibrant ministry for our church in the past, and I would certainly love to put a group together to do that. But we need pretty much a minimum of 25 people. Uh, whatever you can do, uh, we certainly need more actors than anything, actors and actresses, people to, to do that. Uh, we don't have enough at this point. So if you are one of those people who would love to see this happen, well, go ahead and sign up, commit to doing that. Um, I'd, I'd sure love to put a group together, but we'll, we'll know tomorrow whether we'll be able to do that or not. Um, as always, we, um, oh, before I do that, I just want to draw your attention to the back of the bulletin so you can see uh, some opportunities for us, for you to plug in with things that we have going, going during the week. Um, but as always, we open our our worship with a moment of silence. This is for us to remember why it is that we're here. I know that if you're like me, you have a very busy life and you have a million things going through your head. But folks, this is the place where we come to worship God. So if you will, join me in a moment of silence. Amen.
Please join me in the call to worship found printed in your bulletins. From Psalm 99, the Lord rules, the nations shake. He sits enthroned on the winged heavenly creatures. The earth quakes. Let them thank your great and awesome name. He is holy. Magnify the Lord our God. Bow low at his footstool. He is holy. They cried out to the Lord, and he himself answered them. He spoke to them from a pillar of cloud. Lord our God, you answered them. To them you were a God who forgives, but also the one who avenged their wrong deeds. Magnify the Lord our God. Bow low at his holy mountain because the Lord our God is holy. You join me in a word of prayer. Lord, you are holy. And God, we seek today to come into your holy presence. God, we ask that you make us pure. Lord, we ask that you cleanse our hearts, that you cleanse our minds. Lord, that you cast out any evil thoughts that we have. God, help us to prepare our hearts and our minds for truly worshiping you this morning. That you flood your Holy Spirit into this place. May your thoughts be our thoughts. May your way be our way. It is in Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Today's scripture reading from Exodus 33, 12 through 23. 
Moses said to the Lord, See, you have said to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, if I have found favor in your sight, show me your ways, so that I may know you and find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. He said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, If your presence will not go, do not carry us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people, unless you go with us? In this way we shall be distinct, and I and your people from every people on the face of the earth. The Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Show me your glory, I pray. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim before you the name the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. And the Lord continued, See, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Please turn to hymn number 340. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. We will sing stanzas one, two, and three. Please remain seated.
I will be reading from 1 Thessalonians, first uh, chapter 1 through 10, out of the NIV. Paul and Silas and Timothy, to the church of Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you, um, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we live among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcome the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Acadia. The Lord's message rang out from you not only in Macedonia and Acadia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves reported what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the loving and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescued us from the coming wrath. Thanks be to God. 585 is the offertory hymn, Tell It Out With Gladness. Please stand as we sing together. 585. For you today with grateful hearts. We thank you for this beautiful day and the opportunity to be here in your house among other fellow believers. We thank you, God, for your constant love and guidance as we make decisions and as we daily interact with others. We thank you for our families, our homes, and our jobs. We thank you for blessing us with the means to care for the ones who depend upon us. We thank you for being our constant companion during the good and the difficult times in our lives. We ask for your continued blessings on each and every one present here today. We now ask you to accept our offerings from grateful hearts as we praise your holy name. Amen.
Good morning, boys and girls. How are you guys doing? Good. I have a question for you. Do you know what this is? A bowl. A bowl. It does look like a bowl. We call this an offering plate. Did we just do offering today? Yeah. We did. Do you guys know what offering means? Yeah. What? It's okay. Is it a time to give back some of our money to God? Yeah. Yeah. Well, today's Bible verse talks about how God or Jesus gets asked a question. And his response is, give back to Caesar or the government what is theirs and give to God what is God's. What do you think belongs to God? Money. 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 What else? Gold. Do you think everything kind of belongs to God? Yeah, right? God has blessed us with so many things. And our time of offering, our time of offering is a time to give back to God from all the blessings that he's given us. And do you know where our money goes? Like when we put our money in the offering plate, do you know where it goes? Where, where does it go? It goes over there. You're exactly right. Brantley, it goes right there. But look, I want to show you some pictures. Here, girls, come sit right here so you can see really close, okay? All right, so this picture, this says disaster response. That means that we, when people have like a hurricane or a tornado, our money goes to mission organizations like the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, and it gets to help people who've maybe lost their homes or they don't have water or electricity, so that goes there. <gasps> Let's see, what else does it go? Um, oh, who's this? Uh, Who, Miss Trish? Miss Trish, Trish. Trish. And, and Miss Trish is working on shoe boxes to, hold on, to send away to little boys and girls who don't have any toys or gifts for Christmas. So our, our money from offering goes there too. And look, I have more, look. Who's this? Can you guys look really close? Who's that? Miss Peggy. Miss Dale, and who else? Miss Peggy. Peggy. Miss Mary Jean. Miss Peggy. And guess, you, did you see Miss Peggy? And guess what they're doing? They're making sandwiches for people who are hungry. And so our money that we put in this offering plate gets to go to help make sandwiches for people who are hungry. Right. Maybe we can help them get toothbrushes. That's right. Okay. Listen. That's good. Okay. What are these people doing in here? What are they doing? Handbells. That's right. So some of our money that we give to church allows us to make beautiful music to God, right? All right. And now you guys might know these people. Look, who's this? Who's this? <gasps> what are we doing there? And the, what class is this called? Godly play. Godly play. That's right. So the money that we give to our church helps us do godly play and learn great lessons about God, right? Well, Jesus tells us to have an open heart and to be able to watch, hold on, and see when people are in need. I know. Well, we'll get to that. Okay. When people are in need, okay? So when you see somebody who might need help, what can we do? Can we help them? Yeah? Maybe tell mommy and daddy. Say, mommy, daddy, I think they need help. Maybe we can help them. Right? Okay. So let's pray and ask God to help us to realize that, okay? Bow your heads. Can you guys repeat after me? Dear Lord, thank you for all your blessings. Help us to see when others need help and to help us have generous hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now I want you guys to take some.
we get to see how children think when they're asked good questions. Where does the money go? Right there. <laughs> a wonderful lesson. Thank you, Jenny, and thank you, children, for teaching us a lesson. Um, it's good to always have the discussion about where does our money go. Will you all join me in a word of prayer? Holy and loving God, you are our hiding place and our refuge in the time of distress. We turn to you now, seeking comfort from the wounds of the world and power to face all of our afflictions. Holy God, we ask that you be present in our struggle. Help us to rest in your eternal promises that we might be fed both with the bread of the world and the nourishment of your word. Strong to resist temptation and faithful in our worship of you. Creative and passionate God, you delight to shape the world in beauty and harmony. And we know that you invite us to participate in the balance of creation. We grow in wisdom as our experience unfolds. We take good learning out of difficult situations, yet also find our well-meant endeavors leading to unintended consequences. We know that it's too often that we give in to our temptation that disrupts the joyous, chaotic order of the universe. We know that we cannot undo all of our mistakes. But we can turn once more to the living presence of Jesus and find new ways to live and love each other and the earth. God, do not let our hearts be fearful, but let us in silence acknowledge our sin and seek the forgiveness that restores your peace. It is in Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Testament readings today can be found in the Gospel of Matthew, and we'll be reading from chapter 22, verses, reading verses 15 through 22. 
Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one. For you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this? And whose title? And they answered, The emperor's. And then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. The word of God for the people of God. We've got a difficult subject to discuss today. I mean, what this text really calls us to take into consideration is our dual citizenship as residents, first, of the kingdom of heaven, and secondly, as citizens of the United States of America. Now, if any of us deal honestly with our faith in Jesus Christ, we would be remiss if we failed to recognize that conflicts will occur when we weigh our love of God alongside our love of country. In fact, that is exactly the conflict that the Pharisees were trying to create here with Jesus by sending the Pharisee disciples along with the Herodians. We can easily see the trap that the Pharisees are trying to set by the two groups that they are sending. The first group is the Jewish religious extremists. The second group represents the Rome extremists. Now we know that the Pharisees were opposed to paying the tax to Caesar for religious reasons, while the Herodians, those who were allied allied with Herod Antipas, were not surprisingly in support of paying the tax to Caesar. So it appears that no matter how Jesus answered, he's going to be in trouble. Marvin A. McMickle, in his commentary on this passage, frames the situation for us. He says, Jesus did not answer the question posed to him in a way that placed him at risk with either group. Instead, he answered in a way that placed believers in the position of having to balance their responsibilities as citizens of both an earthly realm and a spiritual realm. And you see, that is what we as followers of Jesus Christ and as Americans devoted to our country must learn to keep in healthy balance our responsibility as citizens of the earthly realm and also our responsibilities to the spiritual realm. For discussion purposes, it may be beneficial for us to consider our allegiances. And really, this fits into the conversation that we had a couple weeks ago about authority. So I want you all to consider something. Would Jesus Christ ever stand at attention and pledge allegiance to Rome? Would he ever do that? Are we completely ready ready to make the logical jump that Jesus' willingness for us to pay taxes is affirmation of his allegiance to the emperor's authority? Now, in order to be proper servants of the kingdom of God and to give authority to God the Father, we must first understand what it means to pledge our allegiance to something. And that includes understanding a good definition of the word allegiance. Now, most might make the assumption that allegiance simply means commitment or that it means that you're invested in something. But the dictionary definition of allegiance is this, a loyalty or commitment of a subordinate to a superior. 
So let's recognize if we are offering our allegiance to something, we are recognizing ourselves as a subordinate to the thing that we are pledging allegiance to. Now, a subordinate follows orders whether he or she agrees with those orders or not. Now, surely none of us are naive enough to believe that our allegiance to our nation never puts our allegiance with God in conflict. Something that I always struggle to come to grips with is the reality that God is not an American. Nor is the U.S. God's chosen nation. While I have a deep love and appreciation for my country, this is a reality that I continue to struggle with as someone who is first a citizen of God's kingdom. God is not American. Now, I think that most Christians would agree with that statement. But I also know that there are a lot of Christians who would quickly retort that that is exactly why we need to turn the nation toward God. Now, while that certainly sounds like a great idea, and it's hard to imagine how anybody could really disagree with that, let's let's remind ourselves of what people mean when they say that. Because essentially, what people who say that mean is that they are ready to take away Americans' freedom to worship how they choose. The latest poll by the Pew Research Center found that 70% of the adult population in America identify themselves as Christians. If we really felt like making Christianity the law of the land, that means 30% of our population would be forced outside of their own volition to worship in something that they don't believe. Is that the way of Christ? Is that how Jesus handled people? Is that what it means to usher in the kingdom of God? To get laws passed that require the masses to blindly follow? And of course, that's even supposing that the 70% of Christians all thought and worshipped the same way. If we make Christian thought the rule of the land, whose teachings are we to follow? The Pope's? The Mormon's? The Pentecostal's? Or maybe whoever is elected president at a certain time? Or perhaps we could all agree to fall behind in line of the good old Baptists. Certainly the nation could get behind that idea, and certainly there would be no contention there. Today's scripture, where Christ says, Give therefore to the emperor the the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's, This is not merely a question of politics or dual citizenship. It's also a question of freedom of conscience. You see, the thing that Baptists have always said about freedom of conscience is that worship without the freedom of conscience is not worship at all. That is why we have always stood up for freedom. Not just freedom for all Christians, but we have always stood for freedom of all people. Whether we agree with them or not. And no matter how bad we want to, and I think we all feel this way at certain points in our life, but no matter how bad we want to, we would never, we could never force God upon a person who is unwilling. Have you ever tried to do that? Doing that will push them in the complete opposite direction. If we are forceful in our approach to non-believers, we're not really representing God at all. We're representing our own best interests. We're representing a very small and narrow view of God. 
And if any among us thinks that God forces himself upon us, perhaps we should re-examine our own relationship with Christ. But what God does do is he, he woos us. See, God, God doesn't need a relationship with us. God is not needy. But God does deeply desire a relationship with us. That's why he created us, to be in communion with him. He created us with the hopes that we would be in intimate relationship with him. And that's exactly what makes our worship sweeter. We cry out to God. We sing our songs of joy and praise because we are grateful for this life. And we choose to give everything that we have back to him. Just like Jenny mentioned in our children's message, everything is God. It's all his. We worship out of gratitude. Not because we are forced or mandated by man's law. You see, that's what it means to give back to God the things that are God's. We are God's. Our voices are God's. Voices. Our consciences belong to God. So when we choose to worship Him each and every day, we are inviting Him to be the ultimate authority in our lives. We are His subordinates, choosing to follow His will for this world. And if we truly align ourselves to that submission, Sometimes that means that we will find ourselves living in contradiction to the laws of man. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is what do we do when our allegiance to Caesar conflicts with our allegiance to Christ? Or for Americans, what do we do when our allegiance to America conflicts with our allegiance to Christ? And we cannot answer that question effectively unless we are doing our best to weigh and balance what it means to have one foot in an earthly realm and one foot in a spiritual realm. Now, some people see truth as black or white. The Pharisees were of this group which is why I don't think in their plotting that they were able to foresee any way that Jesus could have gotten out of this trap. They only saw it as one way or the other. They couldn't see the gray. We are dual citizens. We are citizens of America and we are citizens of God's kingdom. Now, we don't necessarily need to draw a line in the sand unless the time comes for us to draw a line in the sand. After all, Jesus, he didn't bring this argument to the Pharisees, did he? They brought it to him in hopes that he would give them just enough rope to hang him with. So this is not necessarily about drawing a line in the sand. But it is true that when we are living in accordance with the will of God, that we will find ourselves living with a conflict with the expectations of this world. This is a difficult subject to deal with today. I thought about passing, but after being at the commissioner's meeting this past week, I thought that might not be a good idea. It's a difficult subject because we're essentially invited to contemplate what it means to be dual citizens. Citizens of the United States of America and citizens of the kingdom of God. And while struggling with this concept is healthy for us, we can also recognize that America was built 
on an ideal that any and all Christian can and should get behind. And that is the understanding that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. As long as the direction of our nation upholds those ideals, I think we can be proud of our role as dual citizens. But when it does not, we must work hard to ensure that we are creating a place where liberty and equality can flourish. Citizens of America, we should seek to be patriots, willing to pay our share of taxes to help make that ideal a reality. And as children of God, may we seek first the kingdom of heaven and not offer blind allegiance to a will that is not of the Father in heaven. May we not offer blind allegiance that does not look like the Christ his kingdom best represents. And may we free ourselves to be guided completely by the Holy Spirit in all that we say and all that we do. Will you join me in a word of prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our invitation this morning is for any who are looking to align their wills with the kingdom of heaven, any who are seeking to become closer followers of Jesus Christ. Whether you've been a member for this, of this church for a lifetime or whether you're a new believer looking for a church to call your home, we invite you as we stand and sing our hymn of commitment, number 412, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. Let us stand together and sing.
thank you all for making this service a part of your day. And um, uh, I tell you, I really struggle putting a message together today because of my struggle of what it means for me to be a dual citizen. And I, I think that we all face that every day that we wake up and, and we face this world that we live in. Um, what does it mean to be a proud American while also being a proud citizen of the United States, or excuse me, a citizen of the kingdom of God? And I'd love to hear your stories. If you, you want to share with me what it means for you to be a dual citizen, I would, I would love to hear some of those stories. Um, come by this week. I'll be at the office and uh, would love to, and maybe we can share some of those on Wednesday night. By the way, we'd love for you to join us. If you haven't been joining us for Wednesday night, our, our book study, The Equipping Church, we're going to finish up chapter uh, three this week. So finish the, the second half of that. And I hope that you can all join us for that. Um, but I also hope that you can go out and to continue the struggle of what it means to be a dual citizen. Will you join me in a word of prayer? May we all be blessed by the God of hope, love, and peace. And may we take that blessing out into the world that we too might become a blessing to others.